Okay, so I'm going to jump in on that note. I'm going to jump into the WordNet section here. So tonight we're going to do WordNet. Next week we'll do entity recognition. And then the week after that we'll have a break. Hey, no problem. All right, so semantic analysis. Well, as a recap, what we've learned how to do so far is clean data sets, which I'm super excited, FYI. So um, on May the 16th, I think. Yeah. So one of the next days that we're supposed to have an executive session, which obviously we're not having in person, but we are going to have online in a similar fashion to last time. But one of the things that we're going to get to work on is this new data. So I told you guys we launched our international project today, and I hope by the 16th we'll have tons of data for you guys to work with. And what we're going to do is take a couple of the columns of the data that are raw text. So we have an option where people are supposed to type in what country they're in. Well, country is an interesting question because it can be written lots of ways. So by the way, I wrote some code just to try to process all the ways that people could write America, <laughs> United States, USA, USA with a dot, America, because people do that, um, America, the United States of America, like trying to get all the ways to capture so that we can code those as one thing. It's kind of intense, but then when you throw in the issue of the fact that we're going to ask this of people who are speaking other languages, so, you know, I, um, they, you know, in French, if they were in the U.S., and they were, but they were speaking French, they would say désertage me. So, like, it's totally, it's a different um, issue. It's not just figuring out how to combine all of these in English. We also have to figure out how to combine them in other languages. So what we're going to do is part of our executive session is work some more on just processing raw text and we're going to use this data and so everyone will be able to contribute to the algorithm that our team ends up using. So your assignment will be to help us build an algorithm that processes this kind of data and we'll give you more practice on um, the processing raw text which is generally what people need some extra work on. Um, but y'all went great. This first assignment went pretty well. So, um, but FYI, so we're going to get to do something really fun with some new data um, and more on that later uh, after we have some more data points. Okay. But what we've done so far is we've had process raw text and then how to build your own part of speech tagger. Okay. So at the very lowest level, Part of speech tagging is a very small measure of what's, what I'm going to call semanticity or meaning because understanding a word's part of speech has a big um, component to meaning. And remember, we talked about the word fire. We had some trouble processing it because it generally is thought of as a noun, which contributes to that understanding of meaning, right? It's the thing that you put in your, it burns in a fireplace or it's like, you know, to, to light um, a candle or a cigarette or whatever. Um, versus the way that we were using it where fire was to um, terminate someone's job. So understanding the difference between it being a noun and a verb is key. Okay. Um, so part of speech tells us a lot about meaning, even though we don't necessarily have the literal meaning of a word when we're just doing part of speech tagging. So now what we're going to move into is getting the literal meanings of words. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're mostly tonight going to talk about WordNet because I think WordNet is kind of an amazing tool. And there are WordNets in other than English, but we'll work with the English dictionary. And we're going to look at sin sets. And so I have to laugh sometimes at how much my research overlaps with things in ways that I find unintentional. So on this giant project that we're working on, um, what we found was this team was working on creating different versions of their study. So they wanted to use different words and try different versions of the study or different stimuli. And so they were talking about um, how they might find new words. Let me see. Yeah, you can't see, it's like lagging. Give me a second, I'll stop it and start it. Hmm. 
Let me make sure I'm on the right Wi-Fi. Yep. Mm, how about now? Yeah, it looks good. How about you guys? Perfect. Thanks. Um, how can we come up with new words? And I immediately was like, well, you could look them up in WordNet. <laughs> And so have it, having them know what a sin set was. So what are the synonyms of that word? You've got to be really careful with words that have lots of meaning. So we've talked about polysemes this semester. Um, and then another layer of their question, um, uh, when they were talking, they gave some word examples. I'm like, that's really great, but how does that translate? And they're like, oh. I think, I think that unintentionally translates in a way that you don't want it to. So one cool thing about our team is uh, we have people who speak lots of different languages, which is really fun. But when they do these translations, what they do is they go from English to the target language and then target language back to English. So you can see how much it changed to get a good feel for if the translation is going to be an issue. Now, that's not anything I can do with WordNet, but it's an interesting question, right, of semantics. So do translations mean the same thing. Uh, so we're going to focus on sin sets mostly tonight, but also some other types of words and their relationships to each other. So in WordNet, if I can get this to start working, there we go. We can analyze lexical semantic relations, so understanding how the part of speech influences its definition. And then the purpose of this could really be useful for word sense disambiguation. So we'll write a little simple little code thing that if I give in a sentence, can I tell which meaning it's accessing in the sentence? And then next week we'll get into named entity recognition. So WordNet, what is WordNet? Well, it's a large lexical database and it started in English in the early aughts, right? So early 2000s, and then has been expanded to other languages. The original English version is on Princeton's website, so we can take a quick at that. So you can use WordNet online. Now, if you are um, working on the server, I've already installed this, but if you're working on your own computer, you do have to download it to get this uh, package to work. It does run much better in Python. Um, and they've updated it like in the last 10 years i don't know that i think it's like the most up-to-date version of english but it's a good like stable version of english so it doesn't it's not gonna have as much slang it's gonna be mostly words that are common and um don't really go anywhere I like cheese cheese is the word <laughs> because it's one of my favorites um and dog and cat right these are common nouns commoner nouns that um while they can have slang meanings, tend to have a core set of meanings and they don't really change over time. So, back up here. So, remember, we discussed the difference, big difference between function words and content words, where function words are the words that hold up the sentence. These are determinants and conjunctions and prepositions. Content words are the ones that do the semantics and the meaning in the sentence. So um, things like uh, nouns, adjectives, adverbs, excuse me, verbs. That's what I'm missing, the big four. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs are mostly content words. And WordNet is a dictionary of content words. It mostly does not have non-content words. The double, double negative. It just has content words, if that makes it easy. And it's built heavily influenced by Collins and Collins, original models of semanticity, on this higher, hierarchical structure. Meaning, at the very top of the word net hierarchy is the word entity. Okay. From that, it breaks down English into these is a, has a kinds of relationships where um, things like animal, the next layer down might be dog, and the next layer down from that might be beagle. So this is built in this structure of a dog is an animal, which is a me mammal, vertebrate, which is, I don't know. So um, we'll see some of these structures here in a little bit. 
And so every item is related to every other item by being connected through this tree. So that kind of structure allows me to calculate similarity and how much things should mean the same thing by how close they are together in the dictionary. So words are then clustered into what are called sin sets or synonym sets, but sin sets is just much more fun to say. Right? It almost sounds like a show in Las Vegas, sin sets, right? Um, and these are words that have the same semantic meaning loosely. Right? So there are um, going to obviously be subtle differences because otherwise why would you have two words that mean the same exact thing, but like good and great. Those are very similar words. They can probably be exchanged in a sentence and maintain most of the meaning. There's a little bit of subtle inflection there um, of strength, but generally those are interpreted as roughly the same. And so this WordNet as a whole contains over 150,000 words grouped into 120-ish sin sets. I just saw on their website it says 117,000. 117,000, yeah. And many more combinations. So for each word, it has all the different senses of that word. So for um, cheese, it's got like eight different senses. So let's just look up cheese. Maybe I'll make that a little bit clearer. Net. So let's use the online data set real quick. And I'll show you how to use with R and with Python. So here's the dictionary page for cheese. So it's got four different definitions. And so this is a word sense pair. So while there are 150,000 words, you know, each word may have multiple pairs. Dog has a bunch, if I remember correctly, yeah. So a bunch of them in nouns and one verb. Where did it go? Here. There we are. And so it can be accessed mostly the easiest way, honestly, to do this is in the NLTK package in Python. There is a WordNet package in R. I'm going to show you WordNet in R first to mainly show you how um, <laughs> terrible it is. It's, um, it's not great. So we'll, we'll look at that. Okay, so let's see here. Um, since that's all right. So these are words that are defined that are semantically similar or synonyms. And they're not going to be exactly the same, but they're mostly centered around that same content and concept. So these are things that have similar features or similar relationships to other words. And they might also include collocates, although I would say in WordNet that's generally not true. Um, so while um, peanut butter has a set, uh, an association tied to it of the way that we use it, that would be considered a collocate or multi word combination. They co locate, is the way I remember this. Um, I would say that peanut butter and WordNet's not going to come up in a sin set because the individual words themselves don't really, they overlap on being food, but that's about it. But sometimes these are, are multi-word phrases, mostly single words at a time. And words that have multiple senses or meanings, which are called polysemes, are noted, and they're assigned to different sin sets based on their meaning. So let me go back over here. See the word dog here. When you have a uh, a synonym set, it might say, well, this version of the word is related to these, whereas this version of the word is related to these other things. So it does essentially separate them out by their sense for creating sin sets, which makes sense because um, that's a lot of in one sentence. Um, it's logical to separate out synonym sets by the different definitions, because the different definitions are what's captured in that synonym. Right? So it makes sense to separate sin sets by their sense definition. <laughs> that is a tongue twister. So let's try fruit. Okay. 
So Freud seems like a fairly innocuous word that you wouldn't think would have a bunch of definitions, but to prove to you that it does, we're going to first by start by showing you fruit on here, right? And it's got at least three. Let's go back to running this in R. I find the WordNet in R package to be unfortunately structured, and maybe I just don't totally get it, But and I don't love JSON format. I like love JSON format, and I hate JSON format. <laughs> Obviously, I think this is actually um, uh, JavaScript format. I don't, I don't totally know. It's not easy to get things in and out of, is my complaint about the package here. Um, but I was also partially biased by the fact that I first learned how to use it in NLTK, and that is easy to get things in and out of. So it may be the user, but let me show you how it works, and then I'll show you NLTK. So the first thing that you do after you load the library is define the type of filter you want. Okay, generally you kind of want an exact match filter, which means pull this exact word, but you can do some regular expression kind of matching here. So I want everything that ends or starts with fruit. Uh, and so the filters can be contains. Um, that would mean anywhere within the word it finds it. Ends with is obviously the one um, to go back to your regular expressions is the dollar sign option. Exact match means only that word and nothing around it. Uh, you could actually write regular expressions. I don't know how the sound one works. Starts with filter is one where it starts with that, which is the caret icon in regular expressions. And a wild card filter, which I haven't played with. Okay, I don't know how different that is from the regular expression filter. So we're going to get term filter and grab the word fruit. So let's see if we can get back. Then I want to know how am I going to get my related terms, right? So how do I know what part of the sin set I want? Because we've already seen that fruit has five different definitions. Do I want the noun sense or do I want the verb sense? What do I want? So you have to tell it which part of speech you want. So the first one here is tell it what type of word you want, but we want a noun. Two seconds. How many results do you want to return? I could make that 999 because that's definitely larger than any set size that you'd find. And then whatever filter we previously defined, which is find everything that's related to fruit. Okay. Now that itself is pretty flexible because we could find lots of different things. However, when you um, get it back, I'm, I lied to you, it's a Java object. So it's not even JSON. I feel like JSON might be easier because it would be a little bit it's kind of it kind of looks like JSON but it's not quite JSON so if you aren't familiar with that format it's a structured format right, where you have this kind of key value pair it looks a lot like a dictionary in Python here it's a little more what I'm familiar with so keys and values and it's got these commas and stuff so it looks like you and these um, curly brackets so you can create complex key value pairs. To me it looks like somebody who took too much Python and decided you needed a nicer format, which is but it's it's readable. There are packages in R that let you switch between JSON formats. If I go and run this in R a second here. I will show you that it's maybe not the easiest still thing to work with. Yeah, here it is. Why did that look dumb? Let's try again. Okay, so it's this like structured list that I just find it difficult. Like, why can't you just put this in a format I can read better? Like, look at all this nonsense. Right? And it kind of prints like JSON, but it doesn't have the commas. And I tried, I remember when we first started this, um, uh, converting it. Like, oh, well, I can just convert it with one of these JSON packages. Yeah. 
doesn't totally work. And you know, like I said, it might be the user, but um, I don't find this super friendly. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Um, however, the indices here can be adjective, adverb, noun, or verb. Those are the only types that are possible. Okay. And then you put in the filter and you get back this object. Okay. To get that into something mildly readable, uh, you can use L apply to get the sin sets. So what this did, this, this, this here, is it found the three versions of, na of fruits that are nouns. Okay? And so that's why in this Java object, when I look at it, it's one, two, three senses. Okay, so fruit has three noun senses. Across those three, I can tell it to give me the sin sets. So for each sense, it now pulls the related words. Okay, and it still comes back in this wonky, wonky format. But these are the synonyms of fruit for each of the three senses. All right. Now, I just finally just gave up dealing with this because this is, to me, not the easiest thing to read. So I'm just going to switch now to Python. And I hopefully I'll convince you it's a little easier. Okay. So instead of being forced to pick a type, I can actually grab all the types at once. So the first thing you want to do is import WordNet. Usually this is imported as WN. That's if you're reading some um, examples on the internet, this is how you'll see it. Okay. And then you import pandas as PD. So the first thing we're going to do is grab all of the sin sets of fruit. And because here the, the natural function of the sin sets, the natural automatic, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, default way that this function works is a regular expression. Okay. And that's really nice because what I can do is just say, you know what? Anything that looks like fruit could be fruiting. Okay, so um, uh, I don't know that there's a whole lot of fruiting as a word, but let's see. Okay, okay. so it will grab actually all of them at once. Um, and so that's it. That's all I gotta do. All the fruits. Okay, so what did that pull for me? Let me back up one. Okay, it pulled fruit, yield, and then the third version of fruit. So let's see down here. Fruit. Yield, fruit. Okay, and if you keep going, I'll see the two verb senses as well. Okay, it does. Um, it's close to a regular expression. It looks like it pulled um, anything that ended with fruit. So it didn't do fruiting, but it's kind of a weird word anyway. Um, what are all these little pieces? Okay. So what it does is for each um, sense, it grabs the sense set. And it labels them. So these little labels here just keep it straight on which sin set it is. So the first one here is fruit as a noun for the n, and the, it's the first definition. Okay. So fruit noun, fruit noun, fruit noun. Okay. Now why is this one three? Because it should be. It feels like it should be one two three, right? Um, and the reason that it's not one two three is because yield here is a cross reference. And so if I click on yield here, it's tied to the third version of yield. Okay. So when they're cross-referenced like that, it's, um, it picks one, basically. So this is the third definition for yield and the second definition for fruit. Okay. And I do believe within a part of speech, they are ordered by frequency. And then we've got verb one and verb two. Cool. That's so much faster. Now, I can also convert this to a data frame very quickly. Okay. Well, I guess it's moderately quick. <laughs> so you make a data frame. You say, uh, I want each sin set. Because the sin set, as we've already pulled it from the WordNet function here, this piece right here has a bunch of information in it. 
So what it has is it has the part of speech, the definition for the word. So it's pulling, it's like part of speech, definition. The lemma names, so lemma is a root word, it's got examples. And then here's the rest of the loop. So for each of those send sets, loop over, give me the name of the send set, give me the part of speech, the definition, the lemma names, and an example. It doesn't totally print perfectly here, but what you can see is the send set names like we just saw. There's a bunch of hidden columns where it's printed out all of this useful information. And then um, an example. So the last, these two here obviously don't have an example. So not everything has a, some of them are blank, but thankfully when you do this, it just returns an empty list. So you can create these nice formatted data frames. Um, and if something is missing, it just kind of fills it in as blank. So from there, I told it to print the definition so we could just see what these definitions are. And so the first fruit is the fruit that we think of when we say fruit, like strawberries or fruits. The second one is the amount of the product, the yield, how much it fruited like it's um it's it's essentially like uh bring to fruition is another way to think about this but like um uh how much you got out of something fruit the consequence of some action so um this is essentially the idea that uh fruit of your labor Cause to bear fruit, the, the verb form of this would be that the plant is fruiting with the ing, uh, and then to also to bear fruit. So now I have the definitions of the root words. Cool. Now what else can I get? Well, to give you some examples of where this might be useful, is understanding textual entailment. Textual entailment is the idea that we have, naturally we have these question and answer kinds of systems. So let's say the first question that I ask, or I'm reading along and there's a piece in the text that says a hurricane hit Peter's town. Now I'm from Hurricane Alley, so hurricanes are very um, important to me, even though they don't really happen that much up here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> but, you know, if my family calls and says, hey, there's a hurricane on its way, I might immediately ask the question, have you boarded up the windows? Have you packed have you gotten water? Have you filled up the gas? Like, are you ready to evacuate? Blah, 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 this whole list, right? So what is happening there is that that word, hurricane, pulls up this entire, like, semantic list of things that I immediately start thinking about. And if I read this kind of sentence, there's an implication of what happened, right? So the next question might be, how much damage was there? Is Has there been a lot of flooding? Um, did they have to evacuate? How long will the water be there? That's the kind of thing. Um, so the hypothesis after reading this sentence could be that the town was damaged because hurricanes are no small thing, right? Now these two things are not directly related in the sense that I didn't say the hurricane caused the damage, but there is that implication there, excuse me, because we know hurricanes are things that cause damage. And so we might have to have this sort of fact checking system. So what kind of programs can we write that would allow us to be able to answer that hypothesis um, from our text. So you think about this as like politics night. Now I do think the fact check, fact checking system stuff is actually a bit more people based, um, but obviously they have computers that help pull up the relevant information. Um, and in general, I would say that this only works pretty well for very fact fact things. So it doesn't really work well for like opinion based. Um, arguments, but if we're writing a system, maybe what we could do is take the definitions of the words and just see if those two sentences overlap. 
So entailments are encoded in WordNet. An entailment here is specifically kind of defined as like, as this, usually with verbs, this verb entails this other verb, meaning that eating requires chewing, okay? Walking requires stepping. So it's not perfect because there are a lot of these lexical semantic relationships like hurricanes cause damage, it entails damage. It doesn't capture all of these things, but it's a good start. And so there's this cool function called dot entailments that you can grab from that as soon as you pull a senset. And what I've done here is that there probably is more than one senset, meaning, okay, you gotta remember this is a sense set. Okay. And, um, yes, ma'am, are you done? The dog is being distracting. Um, more than one sense set. So like for walk here. There's clearly more, oh good grief. There's a lot of versions for walk, right? And all I've done here is tell it just take the first one. So we could actually loop over all of the versions of each of these words, but we'd be here all night. So what we want to do is for these actions, we're going to say, what does walking, eating, and digesting entail? Like what are the pieces required for that? We're going to loop over and grab the sim set when they're verbs, okay, verbs only, um, and just take the first sense of each word. And generally I find when students get frustrated working with WordNet is that you have to remember that when you pull a sim set, it pulls the entire set of them. So you have to remember to tell it which one you want sometimes. So you could pull all of the ones for walk, but you got to pick one. Uh, all right. And so for that, I said, okay, we'll print out which sin set it is and then print out its entailments. And specifically, I knew these words. So that's all we're using. Here. So walking entails stepping. So it's tied to that first definition for step. And you'll notice um, sometimes they have, they're like cross-linked, but in this case, they're not. Eating entails chewing and swallowing. Notice how there's two here. And then digesting entails consuming. And I'd love to know, like, be a fly on the wall when they argued about a lot of these words, like how they decided what words went in and how they decided they were all connected. And they tend to make sense, though. They're not perfect. But it tends to make a lot of sense. So what are some other relationships we can get out of this? Because this hierarchical structure um, and these, these cross references really give us a lot of power to pull all kinds of interesting pieces of information. So I'm going to walk through a couple of other examples here. Um, first one being homonyms. So homonyms are words that have the same written form and or pronunciation, but have different meanings. Okay, I love to make fun of the word bank because bank has many, many meanings, um, as you can see, right? Um, largely often tied to like river bank, that's this first one, or um, financial institution money bank. Okay? But there are even more. Funds hand by a gambling house. Okay? It's kind of money. A slope in the turn of a road or track, right? So if you watch like... Um, uh, NASCAR, right? they bank around, um, do business with the bank, be the banker. So there's a ton, there's a ton of definitions here. Uh, so homonyms are words that have the same form or pronunciation, but have different meanings. So here to get those, each of the sin sets in bank, print them out. Homographs are words with the same written form, maybe a different pronunciation, or meaning. Okay. So homonym here meaning same name and homograph meaning same written form. And I don't know that the distinction between them is useful past kindergarten. Um, but this is where we can find our polysemes, right? These are words that look the same but have totally different meanings maybe. And I could use that to look at a text and determine how 
interpretable it's going to be. So back to my example earlier when we were talking about having people write um, for our experiment, for our study that we're running, I, had, I told them, I was like, be careful of words that have these multiple embedded meanings because you don't know which one the participant's going to pick. I mean, probably they're going to pick the most frequent one, but you can't guarantee that without doing a lot of asking. But that requires that you process a lot of text to make sure that they interpreted it the way you meant, which is a pain. So uh, in general, we might use WordNet to help us find, like, okay, this word has the least number of conflicting definitions. Uh, so it allows us to do word choice. All right, now let's get into actual synonyms and antonyms, right? So since that's a for synonym, synonym, but we can also grab the antonym, so words that have the opposite meaning. And so I'm going to look up the sin sets for large. Let's do the visual form just so you can see. Oops, not large. Large. And so as a noun, it could be a large garment, like a large shirt. Okay, as an adjective, this is going to be the more common interpretation of large, big, right? Um, influential, <laughs> bombastic, which is just a funny word, magnanimous, prominent, etc. So I told it to grab large as an adjective, and I knew this was the number one, as in the not the number zero slot, because I just printed it out first. So I imported the large sin set and then looked at them and said, well, I want the adjective one, probably. And so you can do that by printing out the definitions and help yourself look. And so I want this one. Okay. So I'm going to say, give me the lemma for large. Now for that, it printed out two of them. I remember lemmas are kind of the root word, so with the sin set for this first definition of large as an adjective, we can see them right here, large and big. The um, synonyms, big, effectively. I can tack on to that, so I grabbed the first one. So if I'm looking at large, the sin sets of large in this definition, what's the antonym? Well, the antonym is small. And so the, to me, the tricky part is just knowing that if there's multiples, you have to loop over them or you have to tell which one you want. So here I had to say, give me this first one, because there's two here, one, two, give me the first one's antonym. And I bet if you did the antonym for big, you would also see small. So here's another example um, that is a little bit more flexible. It's not perfect. We're going to pull the term rich here. And only grab a couple of the sin sets because Rich has many, unfortunately. Okay. So Rich has a whole bunch. We're just going to pull the first couple. And so I'm going to loop over those sin sets. Within that sin set, I'm going to grab the first lemma. And the first lemma is usually the word itself. And then I'm going to tell it to print out the um, sin set within that lemma and then print out the antonyms within that and their sin sets. So what I'll see here is the synonyms, the definition, the antonyms and their definition. So what we're doing here is we're finding, we're grabbing each sin set for all three of them, which we'll see um, rich people, uh, rich as in rich money, and rich as in rich having lots of stuff uh, and then within that, I grab the um, excuse me, sin, first sin set of that word, and then the antonym for that word. So what do we see? We get rich people, and then the antonym here being poor people. It works pretty well. Rich is in having lots of money. Poor as in having no money. Rich is in having a lot of stuff. Um, desirable qualities or stuff, substance, and then poor, lacking specific resources. So like I said, they make a lot of sense. These two are nicely, the set is nicely paired. Okay, tied to sense. 
And that's really the key piece I want you to get here, is that the antonyms are tied to that specific meaning. So rich has many antonyms. Um, we've seen here that they're poor, but they're poor specific definitions of poor, and not just like poor overall. Um, give me about two seconds because I clearly have something in my eye, so I'm going to try and deal with that and take a bathroom break, and I will be back in just a second. All right, it's not perfect. Contacts are weighted because I'm like mostly blind. Um, and I think it's like twisted. So it just feels funny. Okay, so what have we covered? Homonyms, hom no, homonyms, homographs, synonyms, antonyms. Now onto hyponyms and hypernyms. And I wish someone had named these better and it wasn't ridiculous, but it is. So a hypernym is a word that's a superordinate name, which is also not a super useful definition. So you can remember this as a more abstract concept. So in the hierarchy of words, it is one level above the current word. So dog here being our sunset, a more abstract or more... Um, generalized label for dog might be animal. We have our comparison word against which we compare up or down. So a hyponym is one step below where it gets subordinate, more specific. So I have Beagle. She's currently laying in the corner of the room with her head hanging off the bed because she is sad we're not eating. So to grab those, first thing you do is grab the sunset. Okay, you can look at what they are. And clearly, fromp is not what I want. So I want the first version of dog, probably. And so I grab the first version and I say, print out the hypernyms. Great. So dog is directly connected to canine and to domestic animal. So it has two words that is directly connected to up the hierarchy. So these are its bosses, so to speak. Hyponyms, there's a bunch, and I'm sad to say that Beagle is not in the list, but here's all the list of dogs that they have in the system, right? working dog. And it just makes me sad. Let's see if Beagle's in here. Uh, it's in here, but it doesn't come up in our sunset for some reason, which is odd. Why is that awesome? Other than it's awesome, but it's really awesome because that allows us to track the path of how words are connected. So now we're getting into the part where I see WordNet as one of the most useful things if you're wanting to work with nouns and adjectives. So I can track now how connected words are by looking at the path from one word to another because now every word is connected to every other word you just have to know how far you have to go between one and the other. So how many words up to down do I have to go? And so what I can do is grab, okay, so dog right now is just the first definition of dog, which is the most common interpretation of animal. And I can grab this hypernym path. The hypernym path tells you from the top to dog, how many steps is it? Dog to hound to beagle. Ooh, maybe? I just saw your comment. Um, maybe? So within them, I'd have to pull it. To answer your question, 
Bank, 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 yada, 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 yada. We are not there yet. We're here. Let's run this one. Ooh, why is that running so slowly? So I actually can demonstrate exactly what I'm talking about here by doing this hypernym path on Beagle. So let's find out. As soon as this Python thing gets with, with the picture here. Yeah, I don't know what that's doing. Um, all right, so we've got WordNet loaded and I'm gonna finish explaining hypernym path here and then we'll actually test your hypothesis um, from both of you as you know. Uh, so hypernym path is from the top to the bottom. So this here is a little easier to read. Let's find where it stops. Here, okay. So from entity to dog, as we have defined it, these are the paths that it takes. So here's one path from entity to physical, object, whole, living thing, organism, animal, chordate, vertebrate, mammal, placental, carnivore, canine, dog. Or this slightly shorter path through living thing. And so there's two paths from the top to dog. Let's try your example here. So let's see, beagle, sin set. Equals or nan dot sin sets. Uh, what? What do you mean? Let's see what dog gives us back. It is it mad at me for something else? Value error. Oh, sin set. Sorry, it's sin sets with an S. Don't do that. There we go. So, um. Let's print that out. Okay, so there's only one, but I would probably still have to, because it's in list structure, tell it to grab only the first one. So now when I print it out, it's just the one. There's no list going on here. So let's do dog, oh, beagle, sunset dot hyper nims. Uh, oops, sorry. So, octahound, excellent. So that's the word above it. Is there anything below it? Hyponyms, nothing below it. Okay. So it's at the very bottom. There is nothing below beagle in this chain, but there is dog above, or hound above it. And so now we can demonstrate this hypernym path and see if you guys are correct. bigger. So let's find Beagle here. Oh, you're close. Dog to hunting dog to hound to Beagle. Or let's see, dog to hunting dog to hound to wait. wait it's, oh, it's just the two different paths. So from dog, the only path is hunting dog to hound to Beagle. So you guys are close, very close. You have the word above it, but there's one more above that. All right. And so, yeah, great example. That worked really well. I'm going to write that down for next semester. Um, the usefulness of this path thing, other than just kind of fun for that, is to count, like count how deep a word is. And so one thing that a lot of, um, at least word nerds, are really interested in is the idea of concreteness versus abstractness because there's lots of different things that people do mentally when processing concrete versus abstract words. And that's often a very difficult concept for words that are sort of ambiguous, so to speak. Like dog is pretty concrete. I can touch that. I can pet it and walk over in the corner and pet her. Um, but there are some words that are, are very much in the middle and it's hard to, to have a good feel for how touchable concrete they are versus abstract. Some things, abstract things are very easy, like truth, truth is a pretty abstract word. Okay. Um, so what we could do is use WordNet to find that structure. Okay. So how many items deep is it? <laughs> because if it's towards the bottom, it's more concrete because it is the last item in a path. 
if it's higher up the hierarchy, it's more abstract. Okay, like entity is very abstract. And so is object. <clears throat> uh, so other things we can grab, so that's hypo and hypernym. This is moving up and down the hierarchy. Um, something that we've talked about a little and we'll get more into is this idea of features. So words have specific features tied to them. So we've talked about entailment. Holonyms and meronyms are similar concept. So a holonym is the name for a collection of objects. So a tree is made of four. It, I'm sorry, a tree is made of forests. Oh my goodness. A forest is made of trees. Um, I've always, I read somewhere at one point that a collection of zebras is Zazzle, but that may just be made of internet thing. Um, but you know, a, a pack of wolves is I kind of idea. And so some of those are coded. Now not everything has a collection name, Oops. but tree does. So let's show you guys. So we'll grab tree. So the first step generally is tree and unfortunately sin set. Singular is also a function, so you saw me just make that mistake, so we treat it with the S. There's a bunch of definitions for trees, so we're going to grab the first one, which is a woody plant having a main trunk. That's pretty much the version of tree we want. So I grabbed that one. And I said, what are the holonyms? What, what does that thing make up? So a collection of trees is called forest. Um, that's really good for Jeopardy. I'm not sure, other than being cool, like how I might use that now, right? since it doesn't have a lot of newer slang words. Um, but meronyms are a lot of fun because they're the, the pieces of an object. And I would say this is pretty contentious. I like that they have these encoded, um, but I would argue that these things are fairly variable among people. So if you ask people, what makes a zebra a zebra? We can agree on like a couple things. Stripes, right? horse, black and white. <laughs> Usually are the like things that we can agree on. But human experience often um, um, heavily influences our understanding of what things are and like how to interpret them in the world because we all have different experiences. And so, um, you know, another feature for zebra might be mean because people like understand that they're like, they're not horses, they're wild animals, so they're mean, or it's horses are nice, in theory. Um, and so these definitions and these meronyms are very cool that they're coded, but I would argue they have very little to do with how people actually tell you these answers. Okay? So if I asked you, what makes a tree a tree? You would probably say things like, oh, it's got leaves, right? Um, it's got branches. It maybe might say tall. It has a trunk. You might say it has bark, right? But that is literally none of the things in the first set here. So meronyms are the like parts, the components that build an object. So here they've got burl, crown, limb, stump, and trunk. Here's the only one I mentioned. I guess branches and limb might be pretty close here. A substance meronym is like the inside of an object. So trees can be made of heartwood or sapwood, whereas trees are built from, so to speak, these things. Now I like these, I think it's pretty cool. And then the comparison though to what people say, I think that match is pretty small. Um, and often in with text analytics, we're really trying to understand what people are telling us. Not maybe static definitions that don't change. But I do think it's kind of a neat feature that they have coded in. Now let's get, like, for the last little sec, a uh, couple minutes here, let's talk about what I use this for. Like, this is really cool. It's kind of fun, kind of fun to play around. But, like, what would someone do with this? And what I use it for is similarity computation. Or if I'm trying to look up for a project, like what word can I use that's really similar to this one? And I don't just mean like um, the similarity we're gonna do here, I mean like synonyms wise. Okay. So within the, the beauty of WordNet is that it's built into a structure. Right? And that structure is really handy 
and allows me to think about similarity in a way that is different from other types of similarity. Okay, so one thing we can do is look at how many features of word do words share. That's the kind of computational similarity that I tend to calculate. So horses and zebras have a lot of similar features. They've got legs. Um, there's more than that, <laughs> but this idea that they are um, considered related objects because they share the same um, sets of visual cues, right? Um, here, what we've got is how close the words are because of that hierarchical connection. So words that are on the same level are very related. Um, or I can just count how many hops do I have to do to get from one word to another. So from dog to beagle, what we found out is it's dog to hunting dog to hound to beagle. So it's four hops. It's more than you might expect. Okay. Generally, if it's one hop, it's very close together. So dog to hunting dog would be one hop. And this network, uh, another version of it you can look at, it's called the small world of words. And you can actually take this study. <laughs> You've visited this page too many times. It open. There it goes. Where um, some friends of mine did some really cool work about understanding word associations, but my favorite part is this visualization tab um, where you can build different types of hop, uh, networks, hops, basil, it's just two cheese because it's my favorite word and one of my favorite foods, right? So in a one hop network, these are all words that people mentioned the um, very first time. Okay? So if I said cheese, the first word that came out of their mouth was food. Okay? I do think here in this picture, the larger the bubble, the more it is mentioned together. Bigger, there we go. Um, the coloring, I don't know if I, it might be slightly just to make some, some um, visual distinction here, but I think they're kind of tied by the interconnections. Um, one second, I'll answer your question. They're tied by the interconnections within those. So these three are also interconnected, so they're colored differently. Uh, no, this is not based on WordNet. This is based on their own research. So if I go back here, what they had people do, you can actually take the study if you want, and maybe in your own native language. Um, what you do is, since I have taken this like 3,000 times at this point, um, they give you a word and you just write down the first three words that come to mind. So if I said zebra, because zebra has always been my teaching example, um, I would write down like horse, stripes, um, mean and hit next and you get a new word so you write down the first three words that pop to mind it's kind of like the American show Family Feud if you've ever seen that so just the first thing that comes to mind uh, the English data set is something like 12 million responses um, you can also if you click on research page I do believe you can download the data set yeah for use and this is, might be a cool project if you're interested and this kind of understanding of meaning for final project. I can tell I can give you way more stuff on WordNet on um, the Small World of Words project. Uh, I really think it's one of the coolest things that's come out in the last couple of years, but I'm biased because <laughs> it's in my own area. Uh, can you have a visualization? Now in WordNet, yes. In WordNet, that kind of visualization will be hierarchical though. So uh, let's go back here. Let's do cat this time. It would be like, cat you would see like up and down so you could build a um, build like a little tree around it so what's the one word up and one word down and then do that is there's one word what's its other connection uh, this is i hope that makes sense so like you would look up its holonyms and its um sorry not holonyms hypernyms and hyponyms and then you might look up the hypernym and um hyponym for that word, and you could kind of start to build the tree. You couldn't do the whole structure of the data set though because it is very, very large. Um, this, what it does really is just grab the word that people said first. So for cat here, um, you can also do, I think you can just look at, oh, let's see what it does. Ooh. 
3D network of their relationships. Oh, you can turn it! Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see that they had made this work. So you can see, like, in space, which words are more connected. That's neat. Uh, on WordNet, you, you would just move moving up and down the hierarchy. Um, let's see. I, I know you can also, there's, um, you can grab related words. So these are the words that share similar responses. So um, to, from cat, the word that has a similar pattern of answers would be cat. If that makes sense. Kitten, kitten, kitty, kitty that kind of thing. I don't know what the play button does. Does it move? I don't know what the play button does. And they used to have it where you could um, print things out. Yeah. So you can see the frequencies underlying this network. So with cat, the forward association, the first word that came out of someone's mouth when you said cat was dog, clearly large and far, right? It's the most frequent thing. So if you're playing Family Feud and you could like look this up in the background, this may help you win. It's not that great. But um, backwards associations are from meow, the first word that came up is cat. And these are based on um, this. I don't know how this is 41 and this is 65, but um, I'm not sure how that works. But here it looks more right. right. So out of 100 people, meow to cat came up 95 times. Yes, yeah, so I don't know why this is 41. This number should be bigger than the largest number, if I understand correctly. Unless somebody wrote dog twice, which would be weird. But yeah, the first, this would be the number of people when presented with cat wrote dog as one of their options. Total number of distinct associations? Oh! Oh, I'm misinterpreting. Thank you. Yes, it's the total number of words in this chart. That's what you're saying. That makes more sense. Yeah, so right now you don't can have a good clue of how many people each of these are. Um, that makes sense. You can also see it's related words. It, thank you. I was clearly not <laughs> interpreting that correctly. I thought it was the number of people who answered that item. Because one thing, um, if you look at the underlying data, since we use this in our research, um, it is slightly variable how many people have answered each item because they do constantly collect data. Um, wouldn't there be a tree here too? You could add the tree from WordNet, but in this case, um, there is no tree. They haven't really tried to... Um, I don't think they've really mapped the time course of this in a sense. Like you answer questions one, two, three. So you for for cat you might write dog, mouse, um, tiger. But I don't think I think I know some people who are working on this, but I don't think anyone has really looked at like what number they've answered it at. If that answers your question. Now in WordNet you'd have that, yes. Yes, since WordNet's hierarchical, you would have to build it as this like up and down structure. Whereas this, the visualizations are generally network graphs, yeah. That's a good question. I don't think they're related side to side. Like, when things are related pathwise up and down, I don't think they also tend to, in theory, go across at the same level. But I suppose they could, and I just can't think of an example. Like, a single word node only has things above it and below it in the structure. It doesn't really have connections directly next to it. Those would be considered the synonyms. Does that make sense? Like if I think about the structure of it, it's up or down. But, you know, if I have, what would we say, dog was tied to animal, obviously there are other animals. So 
but there's not a direct relationship between dog and cat be through because of animal. It's like you have to go back up to animal and then back down to cat. That makes sense. I think I'm answering your question. So they don't directly connect out. If they have the same, um, we're actually going to get to this in just a second. If they have the same um, boss, right, um, the same one above it, they're related because they have the same one above it, but they don't have a direct connection between the two. You have to grab this word and that word and see if they have the same one above it. So it doesn't go out. It only goes up and down. All right, where were we going with this? Oh, similarity, <laughs> like we are way off topic here. Uh, so, okay, so we grab this tree and let's compare trees now to two words we know are not related, lion and cat. Okay. So all I've done here is grab tree, make sure I'm grabbing the version of tree I expect, you know, big trees, um, grab lion, big, uh, big cat, and then I've grabbed cat cat, the little, um, no ability to roar. That's a funny definition, the, the thing that's asleep on the bed. Okay, so I've grabbed tree, lion, and cat, and the single send set for each one. That's important. Now, what you're talking about, so this is a good segue, is called a lowest common hypernym. So we talked about hypernym is the word above it. What I can actually do is find the lowest common denominator and find if they share the same direct boss. So this will allow me to move, figure out how far up in the hierarchy I have to go to connect one to the other. And so words that only have one hop, they're related directly, what you would can say was branching, <laughs> um, uh, have the same lowest common, um, have a, the same, the lowest common hypernym is the first hypernym. What this function does, I go from tree to lion, and it says the lowest common thing that they have in common, the lowest definition they have in common is organism. Okay. From tree to cat, it's also organism. But from lion to cat, they're both felines. And then I can also measure path similarity. So path similarity is like how much they have from the top word entity to that word, how much of that overlaps, right? And so from tree to lion and tree to cat, because they have the lowest, the same hypernyms, is very similar. It's not perfect because lion and cat are not exactly in the same depth of the word net tree, but it's very similar. So they only share a little bit in common and that's like entity to organism probably. Whereas lion to cat share more in common. All right, so this is kind of a proportion overlap in their paths from the top to the bottom. Top to that word, sorry. Yeah, but one problem here is this is not really normalized for how deep the word is. So some words have more um, abstract speech before you get down to it, right? So we saw there were two paths to dog. Um, and so there are other measures that we can use that I think are a little bit more interpretable than path similarity. Not that path similarity is bad, but I think these have a bit more, mm, what's the word I'm looking for here? They function a bit more like correlations, and so they have a little bit easier interpretation. So to do that, you do have to import um, this IC SimCore data set that kind of tells it which version of these measures you wanted to use. And my favorite similarity one from the list, there's a bunch. There's Lin similarity, there's JCM, there's Resnick, there's a lot. Uh, hey, yeah, it is. It's not cosine, but it's close, mathematically very close. Um, great question. Um, but my favorite is JCN. It stands for Jan Conrath. It's the name of the people who wrote the algorithm. Uh, there's two versions of JCN. One of them is a distance measure. 
So items that have the, the lowest common hypernym is the hypernym, meaning there's only one hop between them. You go from this item up to this one and then back down. It would be a zero, a distance is zero. They're on the same branch as you were describing it. Items that have very long distances between each other, I think the highest you can go is 32 hops up and then over. Um, that's the distance measure though. And sometimes people have a hard time with that distance measure because um, distance measures are sometimes difficult for folks where it's like, well, zero means they're the most related because they're in the same city. Whereas 32 means they're really far apart. This is like Alaska to Texas. Uh, so a lot of people instead calculate similarity, which is the transformation of distance into a correlation effectively. Now it's not a correlation. It can't be zero. I'm, I'm sorry. It can't be negative. But correlations, I think, which is very familiar to a lot of us, right? So uh, a similarity measure here is zero if they are very far apart, they have almost nothing in common, um, they're so different that no one would consider them the same, up to one or they're perfectly related. Okay. Cosine similarity works the same way, where zero means no overlap between their whatever, however you're measuring it and one means perfect overlap. Okay, we tend to use cosine to mean a measure of their features, their shared features, um, but we could calculate cosine on their hypernym paths. Right? How, ma how much do they match? Okay. Uh, anyway, so JCN similarity, zero, not similar, one, similar. Trees and lions and trees and cat are um, not very similar. Okay. This is lion to cat, which is actually medium level similar. Uh, but tree to lion here, uh, oh, okay, what, what I'm trying to do here is this is JCN similarity. This is Lin similarity, which is a different measure. I think JCN includes a measure of um, information content, which is like way above what this lecture should cover. Uh, but I will tell you, Whenever you're calculating these, if you're going to use them, you have to tell people which one you're using. You can't just say similarity because, uh, like ever mentioned here, cosine is one. It's very popular. JCN and LIN are also very popular, but they give you very different answers sometimes. So tree to lion is 0.07. I would say that's pretty close to zero. But in LIN similarity, it's actually 0.2. Okay. For lion to cat, it's about a, a third. But in Lin similarity, it's very related. Okay. And so you have to kind of pick one over the other. Okay. I've used both. I, I, I just like JCN. Uh, I don't know why I like it over Lin. I don't have a good answer for that. I just do. It's the first one I learned. <laughs> so maybe that's, I'm just partial. Okay. Uh, all right, so where are we at? I think we've only got like two or three. Yeah, two slides left. We can handle this. So this ultimately leads me into what can I do with this? Okay, other than I use it to calculate numbers to run some analyses on in a different context. And we as people naturally kind of use these context clues in a sentence to help us understand. So the words have lots of meanings. I think we've kind of shown that well today. Um, but how can we write programs that know which meaning you're trying to use? This will never be perfect because people say things in lots of different ways. Creativity is a big um, stumbling block for writing text analytics programs because it's difficult to predict sometimes what people are going to do. Um, but this kind of thing might be useful for a search engine or keywords. And towards the end of the semester, we'll look at some similarity measures. And um, one of the most popular ways that a search engine works. And so what we can use is called the LESC algorithm. Okay, LESC is another form of similarity. And this is really popular. This is, uh, I feel like um, if you search word sentence ambiguation, like this is how people do it because it works so well. Uh, obviously this only works for things in WordNet or nouns, adjectives, adverbs. Um, so you import LESC. You do have to tokenize the words. And so what we would do, if we wanted to make LESC work in a data set, 
what we would do is take a sentence, you do this, <clears throat> excuse me, a sentence at a time, and you have to pick a target word and um, the part of speech for the word. So I think, I feel like last week, somebody was like, well, why would we use this part of speech tagging? Well, here's an answer. <laughs> to disambiguate which sense of a word someone is using, you have to know what part of speech it is. So we're going to do fruit. And so we've said, well, the fruits on this plant have ripened. And then fruit here is a noun. He finally reaped the fruit of his hard work as he won the race. That's also a noun. And then we used kind of a loop here to look at each one. So our target word is fruit. We've told it that fruit's a noun in both of these cases. So you could put take the noun part out and put it outside of the um, outside of the sentence, but often you tag it with the sentence. <clears throat> because if we had a verb version of this, we could just keep looping. Okay. So for each sentence, a part of speech tag, each, sen sorry. each sentence and part of speech tag, what you do is you run the LESC algorithm. So I've tokenized and lowercase everything just to normalize it, simple, simple normalization. And so what you do is you put in the word, the word that you're interested in, that's the fruit, and what part of speech it is. So those are the arguments for LESC. And then we're just going to see what it does. Well, within that, it you know, grabs the sentence. It grabs the sin set, like, oh, fruit. So it like runs through all of the possible options for fruit, and then it spits out which one it thinks it is. So given this algorithm, looking at every word in that sentence, with our target word and part of speech in mind, it's decided that, hey, this is the first version of fruit, which is the ripened body of the seed plant, blah, blah, blah. He finally reaped the fruit of his hard work. That's the third version of fruit, which is the consequent of some effort or action. And a lot of that algorithm has to do with word overlap between the sentence and the definition, but it's not perfect. Okay, as you'll see, um, he reaped the fruit of his hard work as he won the race. That actually has very little overlap, um, single word wise, with the definition that we went for, but it has a lot of synonyms in common. Let's look at one more uh, using the word lead here in different ten, uh, parts of speech. So, lead is a very soft, malleable metal, it's a noun. John is the actor who plays the lead in a movie. This is um, one of our on the graphs. It looks the same. It's not pronounced the same. This road leads to nowhere. That's the verb version. Let's see what it does. So in the first one, it finds uh, lead as in the um, metal itself. So it doesn't hurt. There's malleables in both. Uh, the second one, it actually finds sunset for star. It's the actor who plays a principal role, so it's not even the same word, but it's correct. And then the third one, this road leads to nowhere. Um, that grabs the word run, um, and it kind of makes sense, cause something to pass or lead somewhere. Uh, so that way, I would say that's the right version of the word, but we've modified the interpretation of instead of going somewhere, we're not going somewhere. All right. So that should be good because we'll stop and we'll do named entity recognition next week. But I really, I think WordNet's a really cool um, feature that NLTK has. There's lots of cool stuff embedded into it that could make some for some very interesting final projects um, where you could explore the overlap between the small world of words and WordNet as an example. I would, I would find that very interesting. Um, or you could use WordNet, we'll see at the end of the semester to think about word sentiment as well.